I call them creators. Some call them cartoonists and some call them contributors, but I call them creators because they do create something from nothing. It's probably the most important word that I, uh, you know, you can, you can have drive, you can have energy, you can all that, but the passion, the real feeling that, that the, the, the uh, uh, something that sets that antenna off. You don't have to be on a kind of an equal par with your creators because you can't do it anyway. But you do, you're part of their life. In many cases, you're part of their family. And it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's just a wonderful experience because it's those, it's those people that really make the difference and those people being the creators. Well, I think that the comics page is a special place because it is where people go and they see themselves, where they connect with people. We, you know, we do get that comment, though, that, uh, that uh, it, it, you know, I, by reading your comic strip, I find that, that I'm not alone. But uh, we get that over and over again from both comic strips, and it's, it's really gratifying because it tells us that we're, we're hitting the right note. The, the fact is that uh, they resonate to comics because it reflects life. This is the sociology of it. This is a mirror on your life, but exaggerated to a point where you see it more clearly. It gives you an extra insight and also a bit of humor about it. It shows you how absurd some of the, the problems that you've been facing seem to be when they're, they're dealt with by a cartoonist. If they have a favorite strip that they've been reading for years, they go, ah, oh, here's an old friend. Um, or, oh, that's funny. It's just, here I am and I'm laughing. I'm laughing at a piece of paper. I think that is a wonderful thing. It was interesting to see Hank evolve from Henry to Mr. Wilson, because even he said it at the end. He goes, "I'm, I'm really, you know, the curmudgeon." You know, Hank actually was Henry. I mean, that was an autobiographical deal. He was wonderful. Uh, he he took his own son and and drew about his. He had a child named Dennis, and uh, he took his own son and uh, drew a cartoon about it, and uh, and did a terrific job. I I think that uh, Hank Ketchum is to be. Congratulated. He opened a genre of a one panel kid. And uh, he had a cast of characters, the, the neighbors and Mrs. Wilson and so on. I'm more Joey. <laughs> uh, I know I look like an old Joey, but uh, we're not talking about this. But uh, I don't relate to Dennis the Menace. I, I can understand him, and it's fun to draw him in different situations in his naivete in trying to be a help and yet a hindrance. Someone's either been a dentist, had one, or, you know, you can relate to what he's doing, and I think that keeps him popular. Which is why it's really the story of every man. You know, there's, every block has a Mr. Wilson, and a, grou a grouchy neighbor who really, you know, and the, the parents and this kid's running around, and yeah. so it's just, it's there, you know, it's, and it's, um, so it'll just, it's, it's found its niche. I'm not aiming at children, or people who own cats and love cats, or people who love dogs, or people on the left-hand side of the thinking and the right-hand side. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw for everybody.
you never know who, who reads it. You never know who, uh, once in a while there's a surprise. Uh, the, the commandant of the Marine Corps, believe it or not, sent me a fan letter uh, some couple of years ago. And um, he had no relationship to anything uh, in my background, nothing that I was uh, uh, writing and drawing about. He was, came from another planet, you know, but he, he seemed to like it on some level. You, you take some where you find some. You never turn anyone away. Um, they tend to be technical people and people in, in offices. But I'll get email from nuns and uh, little kids, uh, so they're all over the board. I, uh, they tend to be people who are wise asses, basically. I like to say that my audience is the smart, witty, and good-looking crowd. I never know. I always sort of imagine that my audience is probably 20 and 30-somethings and sort of brighter, more liberal 40-somethings. Family Circus is uh, appealing to little kids, to young adults who have little kids, to the middle-agers who remember when their kids were little, and to grandparents. I'm drawing for Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, I, I, I only, I, I, I write for myself. I, if, I, if I think it's funny, it goes in. Uh, otherwise not. I don't think about anybody reading the strip, really. And that's the thing that I've really learned, is that if I'm bored, so are they. If I'm entertained, so are they. Uh, it's a creative act. I, f I feel like it's a form of meditation. So for me, I'm just trying to make myself laugh or try to learn something. I mean, I think that... To be a cartoonist, you have to be able to amuse yourself, and that that's the, the truth test. And so in the end, I draw for myself. That's my audience. I guess I have to say that I work for myself, because if I'm not happy with what I'm doing, I know that the audience won't be happy with what I'm doing, and so I create for myself. Um, sometimes I think about me being 10 years old and reading that comics. Our audience is uh, parents, uh, kids, grandparents, anybody who's been a kid. So I think that pretty much covers everybody. Well, that's done by a, uh, a good friend also. Uh, Jerry Scott and, and uh, Rick Kirkman do Baby Blues. Yeah. And it's a, uh, it is a good family strip, exaggerated to the extent that the, even in the drawing with the, the way the characters are drawn so tiny and with their big mouths and the dad with his big nose and yeah. mommy uh, with the hair. For baby blues, it's it's primarily uh, people who have had kids, which is a broad range of folks because we have readers from, you know, um, all the way from kids learning to read to to grandparents. Um, uh, but it's we we try to keep very focused with that comic strip on issues, family and small issues, mostly uh, the stuff that populates your your home on a daily basis the the, the you know the dust bunnies and the and the fingerprints on the refrigerator and and the glop on the floor you know underneath the dishwasher and things like that that everyone can recognize You know, one of the things all of our friends and my and family and everything always uh, comment that, you know, um, that was always our house. You know, it was our furniture. Uh, you know, the layout was very similar, and um, so they would always crack up when they'd see our house in the in the uh, strip. And actually, our house at the time looked a lot like that. <laughs> a lot, of, all those things all over the floor. Uh, what a mess. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
There was also this perception that um, if you were a syndicated cartoonist, it was like winning the lottery, uh, which was never true. I, I was, t you know, cartooning, syndicated cartooning is kind of like the music business because you try very hard to get a record deal. But that's the first part of the equation. Once you've got a record deal, then you've got to get a hit record. Otherwise, it, it's, you know, you've got a nice advance and that's it, you're out of work again. And a lot of aspiring cartoonists uh, don't make, grasp they don't grasp that. They, 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 they make that mistake that once you're syndicated, it's like getting the holy grail, that, oh, it's, it's the road to riches. But nine out of 10 comic strips that are launched by a syndicate fail within the first five years. Nine out of 10, and those, that one uh, usually will fail within the next 10 years or stop being produced because of, either through burnout or just lack of uh, idea. So it's, it's a very uh, tough, competitive business. I think maybe we all know how hard it is to get to a point where you control some of that real estate. There's a very limited amount of real estate, and so people are fighting for different spots, fighting like drunks for different spots. They don't make space for it. They don't create space. You have to knock another comic strip out. And no matter how mundane that comic strip is, it has fans. Yeah, so somebody's angry. And someone's angry, and a lot of people, and they get letters and cancellations, and editors hate dealing with that. So it's, it's, you have to have a really good idea and, and be very funny and get a fan base really quickly now. I think there are, there are petty jealousies, and, and, all, and you know, just like in, in, any, well, in any family, and I think it is kind of a family. It's a pretty small universe of people that, that, that do this for a living or, or even want to do this for a living. My strip almost didn't make it into the paper because it had no demographic. They have to be able to peg you for, you know, this is the strip for teenage girls, this is the strip for retired people. And I just had a strip about a rat and a pig that discussed death, you know. We <laughs> find that demographic. <laughs> Sweden. Yeah. Um, we're supportive of each other because I think we understand it's uh, to, get, to get to a level of success, uh, you, you usually don't fluke into it. You know, you have to, you have to ha be able to write and create something that is saleable and, and, and interesting to a large you know, number of people. We're in this instant gratification age where in 1950, when Peanuts was launched, he was only in seven comic strips. And it, it was a slow, gradual, or I'm sorry, seven papers. But it was a slow, gradual growth. And nowadays, you just don't have that luxury. You've got to be good, fast, right away. And if it doesn't float, you're done. You're sunk. I think the trouble with honoring people's work that have, are no longer with us is that there's not room for for new people to interpret the world. Personally, if you fill the comics pages with your strip for the retired people and your strip for your teenage girls and all that, that you don't leave room for just a funny strip. If, I mean, if you ask me, the one criteria would be, uh, is it funny? You know, if it's funny, put it in. You know, my, my main audience for the strips I write um, are my, my business partners, Rick uh, Kirkman and, and Jim Borgman. Um, I write jokes to make those guys laugh. With Zitz, um, I think we're primarily um, entertaining parents of teenagers. Uh, we hear uh, fabulous comments uh, from, from readers. Uh, teenagers that, that, that read the strip as well, but I think it's mostly parents who, who find some relief in, uh, in reading about someone who has it as bad or worse than they do with, uh, with teenage, uh, uh, teenage-ism uh, around the house. Well, Borgman is a master. Cartoonist. He's, I have Jim Borgman editorial cartoons in my uh, scrapbook, which I was keeping in the 70s. So, I, I mean, I was always a big Borgman fan. And they really hit, hit the magic spot with Zitz. 
it's just instant classic to me. Yeah. I mean, you can look at some art and realize this guy is innovative, he knows what he's doing, he's comfortable with it, and, and so your eye just flows through it. You're not, you don't get hung up on the art saying, well, why did he do that? Or, it just feels natural. You know, we have to do a comic strip about teenagers, about teenage boys, without bringing up the subject of sex, which is a little like doing a comic strip about Detroit without talking about cars. But we're able to do it in, in very, you know, oblique ways. And uh, I think it's one of those, one of those times when, uh, when we succeeded. <laughs> job of doing a cartoon strip. You know, I, I, I said that uh, it's something I always, it was a dream of mine since I was three or four years old, but I had no idea how much work it is to do a daily comic strip. And now that I'm actually doing a daily comic strip, I think I'm more in awe of anybody who can just keep the deadline. You know, it's, uh, you know, for such what seems like a silly job, it's, it's a lot of work to you know, there's no vacation. You, we're there every day, and you try your best. And, uh, you know, just to come up with that many ideas and execute, it's a really tough job. And I'm just impressed with uh, the whole gang <laughs> that we actually do it. Yeah, because when I first got into this, I thought there was going to be this Hollywood um, um, coolness. Welcome. I hope she fails. But it, it wasn't like that at all. It was absolutely genuine com camaraderie, genuine friendship. How great is it that, 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 uh, that you can you know, work in a business that, that you suddenly eventually maybe become a, a peer to your, the people that were your heroes? The first time I came to a Rubin Awards uh, was in uh, New York City at the Plaza Hotel in the early 80s maybe or the late 70s. And uh, I'd never been to New York before, and uh, I'd never been in a tuxedo before. And uh, we were at the Plaza Hotel for crying out loud, and, and my wife and I got all dressed up, and, and we read the directions. We're supposed to go to the Grand Ballroom for cocktails, and we got on the elevator and went up to the Grand Ballroom, and the elevator doors opened to this roar of, of cocktail party with you know 500 cartoonists and spouses there, all in black tie, and there was you know there was Mort Walker over there. And, you know, Jim Davis over there and Charles Schultz and, and it was so cool we we got back in the elevator we ran down the stairs and came back up again and did it again so the doors would open so we could see it again what an experience and now these guys are my pals and it's also the the nicest group of people uh, you know when I became a member of the National Cartoonist Society it was it's just like family and um, you know, maybe because we spend most of our times by ourselves and locked in rooms, drawing away that when we get together, we're just very joyous. <laughs> but it's just a great giving group of people. And um, I think you see it in their work and what's even nicer, you see it in their lives. My problem is that I have too many stories, too many characters, and no time. Because when the strip started, it was very insular. The family was all together, mother, father, kid, dog, whatever was in the family. And everything rotated around the family and the kitchen table. And other people would come into that family, but then they would go out again. Lynn's probably the greatest storyteller in the, the business today. Uh, she, can, she can write about 
real family stuff. She can keep a story going for years uh, and keep people coming back to read it. She draws the heck out of that comic strip too. She really understands, you know, where her characters live and uh, and all that. So, uh. well, now all the characters have grown up, and they have their own relationships outside, and so suddenly I've got this myriad of characters some of whom are of great interest to people. People who own garages, for example, want to know a lot more about Gordon and his expanding garage and his flourishing business. Well, I don't have time to delve into Gordon's life while Elizabeth is having a love affair with a helicopter pilot. So she's doing something that Gasoline Alley did. She's having them grow older. She's not keeping them as they are, uh, which is what most of us do. But she's having her children grow and, the, and change and so forth. And that's risky. She, she's a risk taker. It's a real family that exists for many people who honestly believe the characters exist. And they will write letters to Michael Patterson and say, well, one girl wrote and said, uh, you shouldn't marry Deanna, you should marry me. And she sent all kinds of photographs to, to, to Michael. And you'd say, this is a cartoon character. And when the dog died, I mean, people were in tears and, and writing letters. And I mean, people are very, very connected to the characters. And so I have to be true to the characters and true to the people who are reading about what I'm doing. The trouble is that they're growing up so quickly, you forget who's who. All of a sudden, little April has become a young lady almost. And, it, uh, and of course, that takes a lot of uh, forward-looking imagination. You have to, to know where you're going with the characters when you start a strip like that. So that. That's one of the few comics that still has a little bit of that little orphan Annie appeal in the sense that she does long storylines, and, and people love it. I mean, it's always in the top polls. And we get maybe 100 emails a day from people asking, well, what's happened to so-and-so? Whatever happened? Even Charles Schultz used to say, well, whatever happened to Aunt Myrna? Whatever happened to you know, Uncle Phil? Whatever happened to, you know, all these people he would name off? And I would say, well, you did it too. You know, you got rid of uh, Pig Pen and some of these other characters. And you know, people see him every day in the newspapers. It's a rare art form, so they really do become family. And I think Lynn proves that more than anybody. It's like a sitcom, in a, in a way, but it's like going to be a 30-year-long sitcom. For the past 23 years, Frank Willard's famous comic strip character, Moon Mullins, has brought entertainment to millions of people. That was my favorite strip when I was growing up. My father, I started off before I could read. I'd go out and get the paper and I'd bring it in on the bed and my father would read it to me and he'd get to laughing so hard. And I can remember one particular strip where uh, uh, I guess uh, Willie was mad, uh, Moon was mad at Willie. Uh, because Willie had done something to a pig, and he was chasing Willie, and first thing you know, uh, he said, oh, now they've passed the pig. <laughs> and my father just laughed, and his tears came down in his cheek, and I, I thought at that moment, I think, gee, I'd like to do that to people. I'd like to make them suffer like that <laughs> and laugh <laughs> till it ached. Maggie and Jigs, it's, uh, bringing up father was yeah. what the uh, cartoon was called and drawn by George McManus, who... When I was a kid, he was just an, a, an idol of mine because of the meticulous line work that he did, especially on his Sunday pages. He had gorgeous, gorgeous uh, decorations and banisters and the stairways and the, the marble halls, and uh, he, he did a, uh, a wonderful job. <laughs>
And Jiggs was such a reprobate a, uh, a character that uh, cigar smoking and, and uh, a corned beef and cabbage guy that uh, was, and Maggie was the hagging wife, nagging wife, and she was a, um, a, a very, very strong um, opposition to, to Jiggs. In the late 60s, uh, there was a whole revival of trying to find the old comic strips. So uh, you know, I was just starting to be a teenager then, so I was able to pick up Crazy Cat reprints and Barney Google reprints and all these old comics that had, like, you know, an anarchy to them. So I think, you know, they, they were sort of hippie-ish and kind of weird. And uh, Crazy Cat probably being the weirdest of them all. Boy, when I saw Crazy Cat at the age of 13 for the first time, I just said, intuitively just said, I mean, I wasn't sure what it, <laughs> what it was about, but I just knew it was something really special. So uh, years later, I had the pleasure to write a book about George Herman. So I got to meet his uh, granddaughter and did a lot of research on him. But boy, I'd sure love to sit down with him and uh, talk about the biz. When I first started cartooning, uh, early 70s, uh, Hap Kleiben was my, was my main influence. And um, I, at that point in my life, uh, I was in my early 20s, I didn't look at newspaper cartoons anymore and hadn't in years. Getting more serious about getting syndicated, um, you just stop looking at the other cartoonists. At least in my case I did. I put everything down and I just sort of tried to, to, to let my writing go in a direction that was comfortable for myself. Um, I'd say that, that my influence was while I enjoyed the, the Sunday Comics page, that my influences were outside of it. So my childhood influences were Shel Silverstein, who drew Where the Sidewalk Ends. And then um, my biggie influence was when I was in eighth grade, and the, the artist in town in greeting cards and stickers and mugs was Sandra, was Boyton. Um, and for the longest time, I thought that Boynton was a David or a George. And then I found out that Boynton was a Sandra. And there was that kind of, you know, moment of, if she could do it, then I could do it. See, this is the reason I became a cartoonist, Walt Kelly. I mean, he had, you know, he was just, I mean, he had everything. The, the volume, the mass, the movement, the yeah. technique. Oh, man. This is the perfect comic strip. The perspective. I mean, he was just unbelievable. The amount of uh, drawing that he put into incidental things, like the, the logs floating in the water in the background, and, and the characters were just so cute. I mean, you couldn't help yeah. but love them. And, and I, I understand that Hank Ketchum and, and Walt Kelly worked at Disney during the same period right. and had a lot of respect for each other. Uh, and I can understand why. They knew good art when they saw it. Well, I, Dennis the Menace, I grew up reading Dennis the Menace. And always loved the line work 
And I used to practice making sure I had all, I used to draw Dennis and Menace, making sure that I did, did the hairs just right, place the eyebrow in the hair just right, you know, the way you draw ears. And um, I used to practice that over and over and over again. I probably could have worked as an assistant when I was about 10 years old. <laughs> Disgusting pig! And your point is? Look at this mess! That's the last time you eat crackers in bed! Oh, don't be so picky, help me. Lots of husbands eat crackers in bed. I'm talking about crackers spread with peanut butter, jelly, cream cheese, pickles, mustard, ketchup, and relish! I started with prime crackers, and I guess I got carried away. Hager on the surface appears to be um, something like the battling Bickersons, where Hager and Helga are angry at each other and fight all the time. But the truth of this, the comic strip is that Hager loves Helga. H Hager and Helga love each other. And that is the subtext of the strip, is that Hager is the strip about a, 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 a husband and father and businessman living exactly a thousand years ago. And what he does is he does anything he has to in the world when he's away from home in order to protect and provide for his family. And he does horrible things, <laughs> which we don't show. But he does, the, you know, he does these unthinkable, terrible things. And then he comes home to provide for his family. And he comes home and he's exhausted because he's been in all this havoc. And then he goes down the hill to the tavern. And then he goes, gets on the boat and he goes and he fights more battles. <laughs> It was drawn origin originally by Dick Brown. He originated the strip, and he looked just like Hagar. Uh, and it, he is, it's been taken over by his son after uh, Dick's untimely death. And uh, he, uh, Chris, has not only drawn the strip to look just like his father drew it, he has gotten to look just like his father. <laughs> we we have heard that uh, my father had a red beard and I've got some copper in my beard, at least I think I, at the beginning of this yeah. trip I did. And um, uh, we've heard that that was uh, from the Viking raids, that that was, that the Vikings brought that, uh, the famous red hair to Ireland, that that was the, uh, that was, that was actually Viking stuff, you know, so. Pretty much Dick Brown was Hagar. Looked like him, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. He just built a strip around himself. Dick Brown was like the cartoonist's cartoonist. Uh, you hear that a lot, but he was truly one of them. And he, uh, a lot of people learned to draw from him. He had this wonderful, clean style. One thing I liked about Hagar so much was it was such a different style for the time. Uh, it was very modern compared to uh, the other stuff that was being drawn. Um, the way he did his uh, line work and shading was, you know, very, uh, very much the whole style of the way things were going in the 70s with that sort of artwork. I didn't know Dick Brown. I wish I had. His son, Chris Brown, who's uh, intimately involved in carrying Hager on, is one of the dearest, sweetest, coolest, funniest guys in the world. That guy can make that guy could that guy could make me laugh at uh, at any at any point in time.
I'm, I'm very I'm very proud that in that Hager was the first and probably will always be the only comic strip that ever uh, actually depicted the main character of the comic strip cutting somebody's head off. You know, that's <laughs> it was very small and it was in the background. It was one of the strips that my dad drew. But he shows Hager in battle in silhouette and he's going like this and this guy's head is going up in the air like a champagne cork. And I thought, well, you know, that's something you'll never see Dagwood do, you know, so probably. That's the, the highest compliment you can pay a cartoonist is to cut out their cartoon and put it on their refrigerator, you know. Or if they're actually talking to you one-on-one -on -one and you blow milk out your nostrils, or I guess the grown-up version is vodka. If you blow vodka out your nostrils, it's a very high compliment, you know. And people just want to chuckle in the morning. It's as simple as that. I mean, you know, look at the front page. Wouldn't you want to chuckle, you know? Boy, uh, I don't care what happens to you. If you can find some way to laugh about it, you're, you're saved. It's good for the stomach, it's good for the blood pressure, it's good for the heart. It's having a sense of humor. If you can see the humor and the absurdity of some of the things that people take so seriously, if you can burst out laughing instead of punching and kicking or throwing bombs or whatever you do, I think that's the saving grace of, of mankind. I think we have to keep our sense of humor and our sense of proportion to what really matters and what is just silly and funny. I'm at it every day, even though <laughs> my wife doesn't like to take me shopping very much. I go into a store, she says, now behave yourself. <laughs> I'm trying, always trying to make jokes with people, no matter what. All I try to do is make people laugh for you know, 10 seconds a day. Uh, that's my, my whole goal. Um, my philosophy is that no matter what else is bothering you, you know, a good laugh is going to help, so it'll make everything a little bit better. That's probably the best I can do, and, and that's pretty good. You're always looking for a topic where there's absurdity built in. You know, if, if the situation itself is absurd, then it's really easy to write, the, write the, the humor part. And business is just inherently absurd because your basic dynamic is you have a boss who is doing everything he can to make it impossible for you to do your job and then evaluating you on your performance. So, I mean, that's just one example. Everything about it is just a little bit wrong, which is just perfect for what I do. I get a lot of complaints. Um, basically, any topic you talk about that references any group or organization, you're gonna, you're gonna hear from them. So, um, you know, I did a cartoon about a unicorn being barbecued, just one example. And, of course, I heard from the people who were uh, some organization of unicorn lovers. They were very offended by that. Um, and more recently, I did a cartoon about the fictitious um, country of Albonia using uh, leprechauns that they discovered under their mud as their main export for meat. And, uh, and I heard from the Irish, who thought that it was not funny that leprechauns might be eaten. So... I get a lot of complaints, and mostly they just make good stories, so they, they don't bother me too much.
you don't get feedback immediately, and very rarely do you do, but when you do, uh, in fact, in my town, my comic strip appears in my hometown paper, so I do get feedback from oh, people. I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to talk about you again. <laughs> <laughs> sure. and, uh, but it's to get that feedback that you made somebody laugh. That, that makes your day, and that's why you do it. It's corny, but it's true. My thing is like, ah, no one sees it, you know? Other people might go, ah, the whole world is seeing it. Um, and so to get social feedback is wonderful. And I, you know, I am a social person. My idea is my comic strip comes from kind of trash picking around at the world and, and picking up bits. It doesn't come from a deep, dark wellspring within me. Um, so. So I like it when the world that I'm living in comes back and tells me that this resonates with them. In my case, it means fulfilling um, my lifelong ambition. Since I was five, that's all I wanted to do. Specifically, I wanted to draw newspaper comic strips. And this is Mel Lazarus, who is a brilliant, incredibly gifted cartoonist and has been for years doing our Miss Peach and Mama. And uh, I think everything he does is hilarious. I think Mel is one of the funniest, most talented men living. And uh, what do I think of him? I think he's great. <laughs> When I started in this business, it was like the beginning of the end of the golden era of comics, it, uh, which gave me the privilege of knowing people like, and becoming friends of uh, people like uh, Milton Kniff, who did Terry and the Pirates, and Steve Canyon, and um, Al Cap, Lou Labner and, and Walt Kelly. I mean, these were the giants. And I actually had a, an opportunity for, you know, quite a few years to walk among them and to get to know them and become their friends. And uh, discovered they were an, uh, enormously generous, treated me as though I were one of them. And um, it was a lot of fun. Brilliant, car Mel Lazarus, brilliant cartoonist, incredible human being, one of the coolest guys you'll ever meet. Um, funny, body, uh, and incredibly nurturing. Terrific mentor for the younger cartoonists. I think we'd have uh, uh, a lot more fun. I, I think I, I'd, I'd have enjoyed inventing a couple of new ideas along the way, and I'd certainly enjoy reading a couple of new strips every year. Uh, when a new strip comes into a newspaper now, it not, uh, well, it's always going to knock something else out. But you, uh, the, the supposition is that it, it could be there forever. I think within the NCS, Mel Lazarus is probably uh, maybe the most loved person since Schultz. All of us just think the world of him. I think that most people are good at heart. Um, <clears throat> I'm the sort of person that thinks that most people will do the right thing under most circumstances. Once you know somebody personally, you, you transcend race, color, religion, everything. I mean, you'll hear about all these tragedies in other countries, and it's, it's just images. But every single person who is fighting for their home and maybe destroys the life of someone else could be me or you. But one-on-one, -on -one, when we know each other, there's, there's an affection and and a love. 
the thing that gives me the most encouragement about like the future of the world is every once in a while, I'll I'll have some uh, very casual uh, uh, interaction with somebody's kid, who just seems really bright, and optimistic, and and you look at him and you say, you know, I've seen a lot of kids lately that don't look like they're they're going to make the world a better place, but this one might, you know, this one's got something. And every time that happens, I feel kind of optimistic. I also happen to believe that most people are relatively self-centered, maybe by design. And so we tend to do a lot of things out of thoughtlessness and selfishness, both to each other and to the entire planet. And that bothers me. Um, I think there's way too many humans on the planet, way too many. And if people thought about it, they'd stop having so many children. One per couple is plenty. <laughs> None per couple would be even better by my, for, for quite a while. Uh, with so many people comes just a hell of a lot of thoughtless destruction of each other and the rest of the planet and the animal kingdom and the environment and the air and you name it. So, but on the, at the same time, I, I you know, it's a love-hate relationship with the species because we're good people, we just don't see it that way. You know, I mean, all, all animals are relatively selfish. That's what keeps them alive. That's part of your survival instinct is to be selfish. But when you're really good at surviving, the selfishness becomes a problem. <laughs> and I hope that, that cartooning, I hope that in some way I'm a part of a profession that's contributing to people looking at, at a broad picture and getting a laugh from it and enjoying um, the, the foibles of mankind and the absurdities of life. I have to hope that that's going to uh, make some kind of a, an impact on society. I don't think our job is to is to prevent big issues, present big issues, and 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 enlighten people in any way. Uh, I think we're like a, a ten-second little frosting on top of like the daily cupcake. You know, it's like eh, if if I can make somebody smile, uh, that's 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 the end of my job. You know, that's it, and then tomorrow's another day. The job of our cartoonist is the you know is the essential job. You you literally start with a blank piece of paper every day and um, you know need to need to fill it with something that comes comes from somewhere you know from God from somewhere and uh, the job of filling it is challenging you know I think we've all we're all very uh, honored and, and horrified to have the blank piece of paper to deal with every day so the um, Every day we get a new chance too. You get a new, you get a fresh blank piece of paper. So it's a, it's a microcosm or a metaphor for all of life. Really, it's what we do for a living. I love, since I was a little kid, I love a, a really funny single panel cartoon. Something that you look at, you think it's one thing, you read it, and your brain goes, whoosh, bam, and it hits you and you laugh. I love to make people's, I love to have my own mind sort of flipped over to understand something, and then, you know, it hits you and you laugh. Dan Perara, what an original.
That guy. He's, uh, you know, Dan looks like a cartoonist ought to look and acts like a cartoonist ought to act like. A lot of the rest of us look more like pharmacists than we do cartoonists. And <laughs> God bless Dan for being funny. One of my cartoons that comes to mind is a guy, you know, walking down the street like this, regular businessman walking down the street, and he says, I'm sorry about the reception on my, uh, he goes, I'm sorry about the reception, the bad, okay, so let me start again. Sorry about the bad reception, Frank. I lost my cell phone last week. This is a chocolate eclair. And he looked closely, and the little black thing in his hand is not a phone. It's just like a little chocolate eclair. And those are the kind of cartoons that I've always loved since I was a little kid. When I think of a bizarro, I think of a drawing style that this is a guy that can, can draw anything and also can draw the background of anything. I'm aware of the fact that any creative effort worth absorbing, seeing, hearing, reading, whatever, has got to be something that came from that person's own experience and feelings and perspective. So I do try to throw a lot of myself in there. And I do have a, a, a different perspective on the world than the average Walmart shopper. Um, I come from the school of once the ideas are crossed, you can stop drawing. Um, and. I think that Dan Perraro just must really enjoy filling up the space with everything that's going on. I'm a smart ass who can draw. And that's really kind of all it amounts to. things that gives me the most concern in the world is that um, information is coming, f I believe, is coming from the top down. And so um, a small group of, a, a smaller group of news outlets um, are able to disseminate information to everybody. And there's no way to tell whether um, it's true or it's not true. It's people being closed-minded and not opening their eyes to um, possibilities, being tunnel vision and seeing only their side of a story or, um, or not seeing any side of a story, just believing what they've been told, you know, being indoctrinated. And one of the things that I found very difficult was that the the whole structure of the news story was who, what, where, when, and how. And you weren't supposed to approach the why. Well, the why is always the most interesting question. The why is about human motivation. And just the who, what, where, when, and how, that's just, that's just nothing. That's nothing to me. There again, you've got a problem with the, uh, just sort of the, the, the prudishness and fear of the American public. People don't want to see provocative pictures or ideas in the newspaper because God forbid their child might see it. And then what? Question that I asked all my life, then what? <laughs> and I hope that, that cartooning, I hope that in some way I'm a part of a profession that's contributing to people looking at, at a broad picture. The comics page can and should look like America. It, it, it should be kind of a, uh, everybody should be there. You know, it is a very, very uh, gratifying thing to know that uh, we've been in the newspaper every day since February 29th, 1960. We started in 19 newspapers, and um, now we're in well over 1,500 papers all over the world. I think this is one of the nicest strips that, that has ever happened. I think it's one of the most, um, it's, it's warm, it's comforting, it's, it gives you a bright spot in the day. <laughs> Bill 
Palpatine. Palpatine is such a character, and and uh, and this panel, this panel has more people calling it their favorite than I think any other comic that I know of. It, and he defies all of all of the you know any rules that, that that I can come up with for a successful you know comic strip now, which is you know hard hitting and funny and fast paced. And here Bill is slow paced, sweet, doesn't have a, a funny joke every day, um, tugs at the heartstrings instead more often. It's hard to find another strip that's touched as many people as Bill has with that. When we first started, uh, I started the family circle. I call it the family circle. And it ran under that title for six months before a, a magazine by the same title decided that that was the name of their magazine and they didn't want it over the top of a cartoon. Uh, I think he called it family circle, but the magazine didn't like that, so they had to change it to family circus. But it's the type of thing that I try for I try to use, find universal truths. Uh, I don't care about the Pulitzer Prize. I want the refrigerator prize. You know, I want something that resonates in people's hearts and experiences. They cut it out and they put it on the refrigerator. That's the prize I'm looking for. And that's what he does all the time. You find that thing all over refrigerators and bulletin boards. We don't get too many that they don't like with Family Circus. Mostly it's, it's, uh, uh, it's cartoon that they really love and they write and say how much it meant to them or how did you see into our living room last Thursday the same thing happened in our house because my stuff is based on the stuff that our kids did. Jeff uh, is the model for little Jeffy in the cartoon and and uh, of course I do see uh, into other people's houses through the, the mail. Then you have something for everybody and what Bill has consistently done and, and what Jeff is consist consistently doing is the warm, wonderful, natural family stuff that we all desperately look for when we go to the, f the comics page. And the comics page is changing and Family Circus gives you that same rainbow and that same ray of sunshine every single day. I think that the cartoonists like it because it has, they've grown up reading it, most of the cartoonists today. They, uh, they come to me and these are guys that'll be Jeff's age or even older that say, I remember, I learned to read from your uh, family circus. Comics as part of society, let's say, are really important in the same way that, um, say, you know, Pez candy is important, you know. Not vital. You don't need it to live. You don't need it to, uh, uh, to feed your kids or to, you know, to put gas in your car. But it's, it, it's something that we sort of crave and like and enjoy as a, as a, as a treat. Cartooning has is, is, is been around for a long time. It was developed here. It's like, you know, they, people like to say it's the only, that and jazz are the only authentic, you know, American uh, indigenous art forms. It has become such a part of American society, I think, almost, almost subconsciously for a lot of people. Some of the words that comics have added to the, to the, the American lexicon, you know, Charles Schultz did so many with security blanket and, and, and happiness is a warm puppy and things, sayings like that. Uh, that we just use now and, and you know, don't really uh, think about the origins. It, comics have contributed. But yeah, I think there always will be. People, I think people just love to see the, uh, th that combination of, of art and literature. You know, somebody just sits down and starts telling a story and drawing a little picture of it and continue to tell a story and draw a little picture and it's just, it's endlessly fascinating for some reason. Back, yeah, Beetle. 
I'm late for lunch. Ha! Ah, you'll never catch me, Sarge! I, I based the strip uh, on my experiences at the University of Missouri. I based all my characters on real people. I had a real professor, a real, uh, all my fraternity brothers were in the strip. I used their nicknames and uh, I've, I've always been able to uh, keep track of my characters that way by basing them on real people. Sergeant Snorkel, for instance, is a, a sergeant that I had his name was Octavian Savu, and he was, boy, he was tough. He was, oh, he, I, we'd run every time we saw him coming because he would yell and scream at us. One day we came back from a particularly tough day, and there on our pillows, on our bed, there was a poem from Sergeant Snorkel, from Sergeant Savu, to my boys. And we all looked at each other and said, the guy's got a heart? I don't believe it, you know? It was just such an experience, you know, to see somebody get sentimental over his boys, the same boys he was going to kill, you know, <laughs> earlier in the day. Uh, so that's what I did with my sergeant, Sergeant Snorkel. He's, he's that way. He's tough as nails, and, but he's got a heart of gold somewhere, if you can only find it. <laughs> Lieutenant Jack Flapp was the first black character that came into a strip, uh, at that time anyway, uh, as a real a person of his own, a, a person of dignity, a lieutenant, an officer, and he was not going to be pushed around. And uh, the sergeant, the captain says something like, you know, you need some help around here, and sergeant says, yeah, I need help. And lieutenant Flapp walks in and says, how come there are no blacks in this honky outfit? Sergeant says, help. <laughs> so that's how he was introduced, and boy, I tell you, I, I, I got into a flap about flap. Oh I, yeah, I remember that. That was uh, that was great when he introduced uh, Lieutenant Flap. That's one thing, you know. With uh, it's amazing with comics what a huge splash something like that would make. Um, I mean, now we look at it and think, well, you know, what's the big deal? A lot of papers dropped it. They didn't. They thought I was proselytizing for black causes, and a lot of the blacks thought I was uh, stereotyping blacks, and you know, just all kinds. Of, you couldn't do anything right, in other words. But I just hung in there, and I just persisted in it. And next day, I knew everybody loved him, and I got all my papers back that dropped it. Picked up a lot of papers in the Caribbean and various places like that where they had a black audience. So he's he's been a member of my. Uh, uh, cast since 1970. Because when I got, when I was growing, up, I ran out in the front yard and picked up my paper because I wanted to get the comics. Today, they're not running out in the front yard and picking up the paper, you know, they're on their computer as well. Mm. I, I hope the comics become more, uh, more relevant to, to the lives of young people. I, I hope, I hope yeah. more young people read the comics. Well, you know, I don't think it's changed. I think, you know, we have to change because the, the market out there is changing. We've got to develop features. We've got to take risk on features. You wonder if, if uh, the way that cartoons are going to be more relevant is for some kind of format change like we talked about earlier where, uh, you know, you, it's not just a tiny little six by one, uh, two inch strip anymore. So I, I, don't, I, 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 I don't exactly know how they're going to become more relevant. But um, I want people to care. I want people yeah. to go to the comics and I, I want it to be something that they have to read. A lot of times people will come to me and they say, well, I don't really like this strip or that strip, but I really like Doonesbury or something. And I say, well, you know, if, if that's okay. If you just happen to like one comic strip, uh, you're not supposed to like all of them. You know, they're, they're for different 
audiences, and, and uh, that's what's great about the comics page. There's something there for everybody. And we can find things that are just suited for the internet. As I said, we'll never, we'll never do it in, in, in print. And you've got to be able to give creators that type of, of, uh, of exposure. I'm not talking about, you know, tasteless things. I'm talking about that, that you just, you've got to be a little bit more sophisticated in saying from the standpoint of uh, the market's ready for this now. And again, you may fall on your face, but the market is ready for it. Take more chances. Kathy is a great winner with, with women because women have the same problem of finding the right clothes to wear and controlling their, their diet and their weight and everything. And the angst that, that she goes through, I think, just resonates throughout the female world. Kathy and I have known each other for a long time. And Kathy and I have battled weight for a long time. And we're both chocoholics. I don't often relate to it because I seldom go into a dressing room and try on a dress. Sometimes. <laughs> she was probably one of the people that uh, kept me sane through that first year, just knowing if Kathy could do it, so could I. If someone else who every time they looked in the mirror saw overweight and, and who ate chocolate at four in the morning. Um, I'm, I'm really far from caring about some of the stereotypical things that women care about, like weight issues, bathing suit issues, um, fashion. I mean, I, I have the same fashion sense that I had in the eighth grade and not much has changed. Uh, not being a 20-something uh, woman who was worried about my weight, uh, I can't say that, uh, you know, it's the first one I go to, but I have a great admiration for, uh, you know, the accomplishment. Um, it certainly is, uh, is perfectly done for the people that she's writing it for. When I, when I first met Kathy Guyswhite here, she was the one that I called to say, how do I do this? How do I do a comic strip? I have no idea, because I was invited uh, to do a comic strip. I had just done single panel doodles, and someone sent them to the, to the syndicate, as did Kathy's mom. And I called Kathy, and she said, I write short stories. I write it all down on paper first, and then I keep it in my head, and I transfer it to the comic strip, because I'm a, a writer primarily, and, and an artist second. She, she makes fun of her ability her drawing ability uh, deprecates it, but I think that uh, Kathy is drawn exactly the way it should be drawn. Any other way and it wouldn't be personal. I've always Im been impressed by how well she writes, and her parents are hysterical. She comes by her talent very honestly. Her mother really is like that. <laughs> Great fun. My feeling is that if you're a cartoonist and you can't be having, I'm not going to have this evening talking with all the people, 
you have to make it tedious to them. Now all the sitting they can't find it, and I'm not going to put them right back on the wall. And I'm not the same thing, but what the achievement with the constitution and lettering the thing in, in English or whatever, they can't trade for myself and I was up, right? Pardon me for California, yeah, I can't give up. Yes. <laughs> so I hope I made that clear anyway. I don't know. I just, it's like it doesn't exist. One of the things I loved about Peanuts was that all the girls were very strong and the guys were very weak. And it was exciting to read dialogue from children that, even though it was adult dialogue, was really the way they thought. Well, Peanuts was a very influential strip. I think that, that Schultz inspired a lot of cartoonists to sort of get deeper into human emotions and feelings. My grandfather would criticize the strips and say, children can't think that way. They don't talk that way. And as a little kid, I would say, well, of course they do. We just can't use the same words you do, but we have those feelings. I, I know many contemporary cartoonists that, that, that say that they would not be cartoonists today without the influence of Charles Schultz when they were growing up in the 50s and 60s. Charles Schultz is the, definitely the reason I became a cartoonist. Uh, when I read, you know, growing up in the early 60s, I mean, it just, that comic spoke directly to me. And uh, you know, it was funny, as a kid, I wasn't aware of its melancholy at all. It, I, in reading it, to me, it was just pure happiness. I mean, uh, and I think it was in the way he drew. I mean, Schultz used to call a quality in his line warmth, that it just had such a, uh, you know, just emitted happiness from the actual pen line itself. And He's what an innovator. Uh, Talking about simplicity. Yeah. And saying a lot with a line. I know. He was I, another one who just knew how to go and throw a line. He basically started with a conventional kid strip and it just slowly evolved very gradually into the peanuts that we know today. So by the end of the 50s, the characters w with their personalities um, interacting with each other and, and basically just trying to figure the world out. He's a brilliant guy uh, and he has brilliant work and I have to say that I was not a fan of it as a young man, as a teenager and a young man. I thought it was boring and predictable and I just it just it seemed dull to me. I didn't get it. Then as I got older I read a biography Maybe even not, his, it might have been his autobiography. Anyway, let's just say I read read something, and um, about his life and how his cartoon fit into the history of cartoons. And when I saw that, Bing, this light went off, and I thought, Oh my God, he invented what I'm doing now. And uh, you know, psychological humor, um, you know, um, relationship humor. And then I just, I was suddenly just blown away by the brilliance of it. And all of his work since then has made a world of sense to me. things I've noticed is because of the fact that adults are almost never seen in, in Peanuts, you get the feeling that these kids are basically kind of on their own to figure the world out. So they're all wrestling with these real adult problems um, because maybe there's nobody there to explain it to them. They're sort of figuring out on their own. So it has a duality where they're, they're children and they're innocent and they're kind of naive and they're cute and all that, which is what the kids like about this strip. 
But then there's this whole other deeper level that has to do with, um, with adult psychology. I used to be one of his uh, detractors, and uh, at this point in my life, I'm one of his greatest defenders because cool people come up to me all the time and say, when are they going to stop running that boring peanuts crap? It's been the same forever, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what's so good about it. And I go, you got to look at it historically, man. This guy invented what everybody else is doing. And I, you know, I go into my spiel, and I usually can convert them because, I mean, you know, who's going to really stick to their guns over hatred of peanuts? What's the point? So, uh... <laughs> the, the classic is, um, uh, is Sparky Schultz with peanuts. Um, particularly, and again, I know I keep coming back to this, but as a foreigner, I, I had no idea how much that was woven into the, the, the tapestry of the country. It's only when you're here and, and you sort of realise just how, how pervasive that thing was. Yeah. You know, when they're sending moonshots, you know, with the Snoopy module. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've had lunch with Sparky before, and um, actually I would want to do it again because I miss him. I mean, he was, he was my hero, uh, cartoon-wise. He was a guy that could talk about so many things not cartooning, uh, and that I find interesting when you're with another cartoonist, because we're, we're a group of people that are, that are pretty good at a lot of things, but not really excellent at, at one thing. And there's a breadth of, of knowledge and experience there, I think, among really good cartoonists that, that is fascinating. And I think we're, we're most interesting when we don't talk about what we do for a living. Um, you know, how, many, how many times can you examine pen points and <laughs> the pros and cons of adding three drops of water to your ink? <laughs> I'd rather talk about the... Uh, uh, human nature, things like that, with cartoons. So Sparky was a great, uh, uh, a great thinker and, and, uh, and conversationalist. And never in my life did I believe I, I would ever meet Charles Schultz, much less borrow his car and wear his shoes one day. Uh, we went for a walk, and I had high heel shoes, so he gave me a pair of sneakers, stuffed the toes full of Kleenex, and I walked for a mile in his shoes. Uh, in his case, he did he did everything himself, you know. The one-man show, did it for such a long time and kept at the top of his game for such a long time. You know, that's uh, a tough thing to do. It's something that everybody aspires to. I knew the man behind it, and I knew that we are all of the characters that we draw. There are days when he was as crabby as Lucy and, and as, as fragile as Charlie Brown, as an insightful as Linus, as magical as Snoopy, I mean, as, as arrogant as Sally. I mean, he was all the characters that you see. Uh, the comic is the extension of the cartoonist, his ideas, his perspective on life, if he has certain views that he wants to express through the medium of cartooning, he should have the freedom to do that. Yeah, I do have a higher purpose. I like, I, I really do like to shatter, make people think, or at least uh, invite people to think, and shatter just a kind of traditional nonsense that we put up with on a daily basis for no good reason other than the fact that we just haven't the, the courage or the um, sensibility to, to question, why do I believe this? I do feel like if I'm true to myself, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not really a sarcastic person. And for me to just sort of spew sarcasm in the strip because that's what people are doing would be dishonest. I think the characters that I write and draw about aren't all good. They aren't all bad. You have characters that are likable, characters that are not so likable, but ultimately I want to show why. 
I do whatever's on my mind that day. And so occasionally, and not always, but occasionally there's going to be my political thoughts on the world. It's very satisfying to make people happy. Um, I, I'm the kind of person who I don't need a lot for myself. You know, if you give me a, a baked potato and, and a can of pepper, like I'm having a feast. So making other people happy is, is kind of what I, what I like. But I do love to uh, work with Jeff, and he, uh, he does a great job of the inking and the coloring on the pages. He does um, a lot of the, the extracurricular things that need to be done in the computer with the family circus, and he's a very valuable assistant. Hopefully someday he'll run away with a circus. And, uh, and it is, a, a, uh, to me, a comfort to know that the family circus will stay in the family. It's, uh, there aren't many cartoonists who can say that. Uh, animals that teach us lessons go way far back in, <laughs> in human history. And, um, and I think animals do teach us lessons. And one of the things with Mutz that I try to do, uh, more than most in the history of comics, is uh, to keep my animals as animal-like as possible. Because um, I think that's where the real lessons are to be learned. I think uh, we're a little removed from the natural world. I think for most cartoonists, uh, it's not really a conscious choice. It's really something almost that they were chosen to do. And uh, they feel like it, it, it's what they have to do with their lives. <laughs> I don't want it to be over with. I've had such a ball. I've just had a marvelous time ever since I was a little kid. I was just always having fun. It's nice to be here on the Today Show. <laughs> uh, I love the comics. Quick, is there a cartoonist in the house? We're a tough crowd. <laughs> These questions are too difficult. Um. <laughs> All right. I got orders. Boy, <laughs> this is a tough joint here. <laughs> You can sing, dude. My mic is bigger, dude. What is it about mankind or womankind that gives you the most hope? Linoleum. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we hug here or <laughs> no? I specifically mentioned nobody can touch me. <laughs> what is it about ma what is it about mankind that gives me the most hope? You know, this is, it's funny you would ask. Laws, conveniences, safety rules, songs, <laughs> dancing, baseball, movies and TV, and jazz and baseball, and, and uh... Basically, people are good. They're good. <laughs>